Now, okay, so welcome once again, everybody. Uh, you're in the right place if you're here for five steps to strategy success. Um, this session is being recorded. We'll send out slides and a copy of the recording after today's live event. And if you're watching this on, on a playback, hello, good morning. I'm glad you could join us. So we'll begin with just a few introductions. Um, I'm gonna let the team introduce themselves, starting with my very good colleague, Mike. Morning, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Mike Kennard. I'm the Programme Director for the Manchester Leadership Development Programme. I'm also an Associate Professor in uh, Innovation Strategy and Entrepreneurship at uh, Alliance Manchester Business School. Morning, I'm Jo Blaine. I'm the Marketing Manager uh, in Executive Education at the Business School. Uh, so I look after all the leadership development programmes that we run with organisations. Thank you. And I'm Kieran. So I work with Mike and Jo on the recruitment and admissions side for this programme. So it's good to have you here today. What we're going to talk about today, we're going to cover a few things. First of all, I'm going to start with a little introduction to the topic, and then we're going to hand over to Mike, who actually uh, lectures on the programme itself on strategy and innovation. Um, he's going to talk about the five steps to strategy success. We're also going to touch a little bit about the programme itself, and there is, as I mentioned, time for Q&A at the end. So this particular uh, topic today, strategy, fits in quite nicely. It's one of the five core modules in the Manchester Leadership Development Programme. And as I said, Mike is both the uh, programme director and lectures on this particular module. So it's great to have him with us here this morning to, uh, to give you those five steps to strategy success. So we're going to start just to, to warm up a little bit um, in this rather um, chilly uh, December morning with a poll. Um, and the poll question is going to be in your organisation, Briefly describe what's your relationship to strategy. Um, if it's, I've got a, 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 I'm going to launch the poll now. If you can just pick the uh, response that is closest, maybe it doesn't completely represent where you're at, but closest. So, what's your relationship to strategy? Are you solely responsible for setting it? Do you set it with others? Are you just given it and it's your job to execute it? Um, or actually, strategy's got nothing to do with your daily work, or you're not involved in, in creating or implementing the strategy at all. So I'm just going to give a couple of minutes to see what the responses are there. Okay, I think another couple of seconds. Okay, I'm going to close the poll and, and we'll look at the results. We all know there's one or two more creeping in. Any estimation on where we're going to be at? Okay, I'm going to end the poll now and you should be seeing the results on your screen right now. So I am part of a team that sets the strategy overall overwhelmingly that's the, the big response I'm given the strategy and implement it I'm solely responsible so quite a mix Mike any kind of comments or thoughts on on that that mix there I'm, I think there's some relief amongst us that some of the questions uh, weren't uh, weren't responded to. Yeah yeah that's right so uh, as you said a, a good mix the uh, last two questions strategy does not relate to my daily work and I'm not involved in strategy at all so no, no one picked those which is good. Um, if, if you had done that would have meant I would have to significantly change what I'm going to talk about later in this uh, in this webinar. Um, interesting, I'm, I'm part of a team that sets a strategy, you know, and, you know, more often these days, you know, it, it is a team effort and, you know, hopefully an interdisciplinary team, you know, where it's someone from finance, someone from operations, someone from sales and marketing coming together to try to uh, develop a, a kind of integrated strategy. Um, I'm given a strategy and implement it. Um, well, implementation is really important. You know, you, could, you can have the most fantastic strategy in the world, but if you're not focused on uh, implementation as part of the organization, then it will not be as successful as, uh, as you hoped. And if you're implementing strategy, then you're going to have the, uh, the, the, the insights to see how strat strategy could be improved um, in, in, in the future. Uh, the, the, the one person I'm solely responsible for, for setting the strategy, it's it's tough at the top, isn't it? You know, heavy is the head that wears the crown. Um, but if you're solely responsible for, for setting strategy, what's really important is to keep on developing your, your, your kind of knowledge and insights and experience of, uh, of strategy and understanding when to, when to stick with it and when to refresh. And, and that's going to be one of the themes that we talk about later in the webinar. OK, thank you, Mike. I'm going to stop sharing that poll now. So, um, Thank you for the poll. So what did 2020 teach us about strategy? What lessons could we learn from the last, well, last 12 months, but also the last 18 months? Shall we have just a very quick re recap by way of introduction to the topic this morning? So just very quickly, 
remember this? We started all here working together. Then there was this. And then we all went here. And then uh, gradually, slowly, different rates, we started to come back to here. And then some of us individually, collectively, ended up back there again. And currently, certainly here at the university, we're working at a mix of like hybrid working, some people working at home, some people working in the office, different days, trying to come in and do some face to face stuff, all while socially distancing. So quite a changeable and chaotic environment. Um, so what does this mean in terms of the challenge that poses for strategy? Well, I've got a little cartoon that I want to share with you. Just um, take a moment to, to look at that, because I think it summarizes the challenge quite nicely that we sit trying to work out a clear uh, concise, coherent strategy, but then the external environment can always conspire against us and strategy doesn't always survive implementation in that environment, especially when it's as chaotic as it has been. So what do we do? And this is often the question that's posed, leveled at leaders in organizations. So given this, all of this uncertainty, all of this change, what should we do? And we call this the leader's dilemma because it could be shareholders, stakeholders, it could be employees, it could be uh, other colleagues, peers, our customers, people will ask leaders and managers, they look to leaders and managers to give a sense of direction, where are we going, what do we do? Now, we're not necessarily in the business of telling you precisely what to do, but what we can do here at the business school is give you the tools to maybe change the way you start to think about strategy. So I'm just gonna share a quote, just one quote this morning. Um, if you just take a minute just to read that, because I think it's quite appropriate for this particular context. So the greatest danger isn't the turbulence itself, but it's kind of doing what you did yesterday and the day before and expecting that to work. So this again is where we bring in the five steps to uh, uh, strategy success and the program, because we're not here to tell you what to do for your business. What Mike and his team can do is maybe start to change the way you approach strategy or think about how you put a strategy together. So the question is, and I, as I'm going to hand over to, to, to Mike uh, now to take over, what, what makes a good strategy? And we'll introduce these five steps. So thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Kieran. It's always, uh, it's always very humbling to come on following a quote from, uh, from Peter Drucker, but uh, I, shall, I shall do my best to live up to him, his standards um, as we go through this. So. I guess, uh, I guess I've worked in predominantly strategy and innovation for around about 25 years, um, about half of that in universities. So uh, Alliance Manchester Business School, uh, University of Birmingham, Aston University, and also University of Nottingham, but also uh, practitioner experience as a, um, as a manager at, uh, at Rolls-Royce. So I think, um, I think the first question um, that people need to ask themselves is, uh, do we need to change our strategy? You know, because, you know, changing strategy um, requires some, some risk, some effort, some resources, uh, a bit of a step into the into the um, into the unknown. So thinking around, do you have to change it is um, is a very important step. And the answer is uh, invariably yes. And uh, the reason is because we're facing some very, very significant global challenges. So the way that we express global challenges at University of Manchester is by using the United Nations sustainability goals. So I won't read them all out, but things like poverty, hunger, health, education, equality, clean water, clean energy, good jobs and economic growth, innovation and infrastructure, um, protecting the planet, the water and land. You know, these are significant challenges that um, all organisations face, whether you're in the public sector, the private sector or the charitable um, sector, but they also present opportunities. So opportunities for organizations to kind of step up and start to address some of these challenges can really help develop um, your organization if you've got the right uh, strategy to, uh, to take the opportunities. Uh, next slide, please, Kieran. The other reason why you might consider changing your strategy is, is competitive challenges. And you know, competition um, now is, is greater, arguably, than, than it's ever been um, in the past. Um, I've got some data from, uh, from the Kauffman Foundation. So the Kauffman Foundation are a fairly well-respected economic think tank from the United States. And they looked at uh, Fortune 500 companies uh, between this time frame, 1995 and 2009. And what they found was something very, very surprising, that over half of those companies, 56%, uh, were replaced in the Fortune 500 within that relatively small um, time frame. And, you know, that's, uh, that's an incredible statistic. You know, if you feel 
and think around the, the strengths that you have if you're in Fortune 500. Uh, think about your, your products and your services and your people and your knowledge and your capabilities and your factories and your infrastructure and, uh, and your brands and your capital and your access to, to, to more capital. You've got tremendous strengths um, in the marketplace, you know, but more, more than half of them fall out in that very, very short time frame. And the reason for this is that new innovative competitors come into the marketplace. So um, I've just highlighted some, some kind of well-known uh, innovative companies and some of these companies, they've succeeded through uh, innovative products. So maybe you can think around uh, Apple and the, the iPhone. So a very, very innovative uh, product that came to the marketplace and you know, had a significantly detrimental impact on say a market incumbent like, uh, like Nokia. Or maybe you can think around a company like Tesla. So uh, a relatively new company that's chosen to focus solely on uh, electronic vehicles and very, very quickly has become a, a more successful company and a larger company. And you know, companies like Ford and General Motors have been in, in the industry for more than hundred years. Some of these companies have succeeded through uh, innovative services so maybe you think around uh, Microsoft, if you think around um, software as a service and sort of business services that, that they offer. And, you know, a reasonable question that you could ask is uh, why is it that Microsoft has the insight that uh, software would become more valuable than hardware, whereas a company like IBM, who were very, very established in the industry, um, didn't have that, that insight. Uh, for services, maybe you can think around Starbucks. So for sure, Starbucks have got a product, which is coffee. You know, but what's made that company successful is that the service that they offer within the coffee house and the ambience that they have, which before Starbucks came into the market, didn't really exist um, on the high street. Some of these organizations have succeeded through uh, innovative business models. So maybe you can think around Ryanair. So uh, a low cost airline, a low cost business model. So Ryanair started, you know, with one second hand Boeing 737 flying one route between uh, Ireland and, and the UK but very, very quickly through their low cost business model became one of the most successful airlines um, in, the Europe, in Europe and very, very difficult for incumbent companies such as maybe British Airways or Air France to kind of compete with that low cost business model. Uh, another company, Amazon. So a uh, business model for um, an online retail platform started, you know, very, very focused look, looking at books and then very, very quickly expanded to, uh, to incorporate, well, just about everything uh, it's made Amazon a very, very successful company, but a significant competitive threat to, uh, to kind of high street bricks and mortar retailers. Some of these companies succeeded through um, market innovation, so creating new markets. So Google, you know, the market for search engines, the market for pay-per-click um, advertising didn't exist, you know, even a, a few short years ago. Uh, maybe Facebook, so the market for, um, for social media. So whether it's... a product innovation, service innovation, business model innovation, or market innovation. These are the competitive pressures that incumbent organizations um, face. And, uh, and also you can flip it around and you can say that if incumbent organizations can um, develop a strategy that integrates um, innovation, they can seize opportunities and uh, take opportunities for, uh, for growth and to improve their performance. So next slide, please, uh, please Kira. So, so yeah, so you know, if you are thinking around, um, you know, changing or updating or refreshing your strategy, and uh, I would say that's certainly something that you need to be considering on an ongoing basis. Um, there are five things that you can uh, uh, look at to help you develop a good strategy and a strong, robust um, strategy. So uh, the first thing, which is which is really important, is uh, your strategy needs to be consistent. If you look at large complex organizations, they tend to be um, broken down into, uh, in, in, into team sections, business units, um, et cetera. And each of those will, will have a strategy, but it's gotta be consistent. It's gotta be consistent with the overall organizational strategy. So there's uh, consistency and, uh, and alignment. If you have inconsistent strategies within the same organization, then you're gonna be less than successful um, going forward and, uh, and implementing the overall um, organizational strategy. Uh, the other area to think around uh, consistency is um, to make sure that the overall organizational strategy doesn't have inconsistencies within it. So a good example would be if you could consider uh, Jaguar Land Rover. 
um, if their strategy is to um, offer a, um, a high priced premium product in, in their Jaguar and the Land Rover cars, that's fine. Uh, but if they also have a strategy to source the lowest cost and the lowest quality parts to go into that vehicle, that would be inconsistent because customers would say, well, you're trying to say that you've got you know, a premium high priced um, product, but when I actually look at the product, I can see that it's, it's, it's poor quality. You know, so consistency is something you've got to be thinking very, very carefully about when you're developing a strategy. Second one, uh, responsive to um, an environmental change. And this is a, a change to the business environment. So we talked about the global challenges, talked about the, the, the kind of rapidly changing environment, also talked about the, the competitive challenges. So new competitors um, coming to the market. So, so when you're developing a strategy, you're responding to changes within the business environment. And even better would be if you could kind of forecast and predict what those future changes might be so you can change your strategy ahead of that to get ahead of the curve. You know, so changing strategy responds to environmental changes or anticipates an environmental change. Third one, um, and this is really important, I'll pick that out in red, uh, your new strategy should generate a competitive advantage. So competitive advantage means it should leave you in a, in a better place than your existing strategy. If you're developing a strategy and you're launching a new strategy, but it's not actually improving your position, it's not giving you an advantage in, in the marketplace, then that strategy is, uh, is inherently, inherently weak. And there's lots of different dimensions that you could um, use to, um, to see whether you are generating a competitive advantage. So is it uh, developing your market? Is it developing the, the quality of your products? Is it going into services? Um, what, are, what are your competitors doing? And where are you uh, differentiated from them? within the marketplace, all of those things will combine to deliver a competitive advantage. Uh, the fourth one, which we kind of briefly touched on, is that your strategy must be implementable, you know, and uh, you've got to consider, you know, the risks of your new strategy and also whether you have the resources within your organization to actually implement it. Um, I think there's a, there's a kind of famous saying that having a, having a good strategy with excellent implementation is better than having an excellent strategy with merely good implementation. So, you know, those project management and those program management skills to take something that's written on paper and to actually implement to execute, commercialize your strategy is, is very, very important. And the last one, you know, one of the big uh, myths, I guess, uh, with strategy is that it's got to be terribly, you know, strategy is very important, so it's got to be terribly complex and it's got to come in a document that's got like 150 different, different pages and takes a week to, uh, to, to, to read. Well, you know, the most successful strategies, they're flexible, adaptive, and they're also simple. So flexible and adaptive, because as soon as you launch your strategy, um, the business environment is, is going to continue to change a bit and competitors are going to react to your, to your new strategy. So there has to be some flexibility some adaptability built into your strategy so you're not continuously having to launch brand new strategies um, and simple you know so um, simple strategies are the easiest to understand from your stakeholders whether that's um, investors customers uh, managers employees and also contributes to uh, to the implementation so simple strategies uh, are easier to implement and that's very very important if you're looking at the overall success of your organization. Uh, next slide, please, please, Kieran. So when you're considering those, those five aspects to, to, to kind of build into your strategy, you also need to consider um, a process for, for developing a strategy. So this is something uh, called a strategy value chain. It's uh, based on uh, the value chain by a guy you might have come across called, called Michael, Michael Porter from uh, Harvard Business School. So um, at the top, you need to consider um, strategy enablers. So, you know, what is your, your overall vision, mission and values within your organization? And what, what are you trying to achieve over the medium uh, to, to long term? And how do you want to run your business and position yourself in, uh, in the marketplace? Uh, the next one, uh, leadership competencies. You know, if you, if, if you don't have leadership competencies within your organization, it's very, very difficult to A, develop a strong strategy 
uh, B, to communicate that strategy to your stakeholders and C, to implement your strategy. OK, so developing leadership competencies is very, very important. And, and the last one which we've we've touched on is, is innovation. So having uh, an organizational strategy that integrates with innovation and developing an innovation process and an innovation culture within your organization is very, very important. If you have a, if you have a strategy that's not, not integrated with, with innovation, it's very difficult to see how that can be successful in the, in the medium to long term. Uh, towards the bottom is, is a strategy process. So uh, the first thing you should consider is, uh, is your strategic position. You know, so uh, where are you in the market? What markets are you in? Uh, what competitors do you have? Who are your customers? Who are your other significant stakeholders? What's your relative um, size compared to, to your competitors? You know, so where do you, where do you sit within the market? What is your current um, position? Um, when you've developed that, you've got, got a really good understanding of that. The second thing to consider is your strategic capability. So this is looking inside of the organization. So um, what are your, um, your competencies and your knowledge and your capabilities, um, intellectual property, uh, leadership competencies, um, you know, factories, infrastructure, uh, supply chain, you know, what, what have you got within the organization um, which allows you to compete uh, effectively? And, and the third one, strategic choice. So after considering your position and considering your capabilities, you need to make some choices. So um, are you going to change your position in the marketplace? And if so, where and how? Um, are you going to change and develop some of your strategic capabilities? You know, so strategic choice is, uh, is very, very important. And no organization, um, no matter um, how large, how big, how successful, how, how, how many resources they have, um, is able to um, choose to undertake every opportunity that comes its way and be in every single market that looks attractive. So, you know, sometimes a choice, it's more about choosing what not to do. You know, choosing what not to do can be quite painful, you know, but that's a key aspect of, uh, of developing your strategy. And putting that all together, so, you know, your mission, uh, vision and values, leadership competencies and innovation process and culture together with understanding your position capability and making choices uh, that leads you to develop your strategy and to focus on developing a competitive advantage so developing that competitive advantage is ultimately what you're aiming to do when you uh, change or develop a, a new strategy so thanks Kieran so next slide so moving on to the Manchester Leadership uh, Development Programme, I'll just say, say a few words um, uh, about this. Uh, so next slide, please, uh, Kieran. So it's, it's broken down into um, five distinctive areas. Um, the first is, is leadership practice, um, led by my colleague, uh, Courtney Owen. So Courtney has got um, a lot of experience in, uh, or practitioner experience in, in consulting before coming into um, university. So uh, leading yourself, is, is really important so understanding your style your preferences um, and developing yourself personally and reflecting on your leadership style is you know really a cornerstone of developing effective leadership uh, we use something called a hogan assessment which is um, a psychometric um, evaluation that uh, that shows um, how you're likely to lead uh, within an organization and give you some insights into things that you might already know about yourself and to reinforce them but also show some things that maybe maybe weren't apparent or weren't clear um, around your leadership style. Um, moving on, we have um, a colleague, uh, Dr. Paul Evans. So uh, Paul, again, has got significant practitioner experience, um, mainly as uh, HR director roles in the, in the leisure industry. You know, Paul talks around leading teams and talent, so, so leading others. You know, more than ever these days, you know, success is through teams, it's through collaboration. It's through integration of, of different functions, and that's a very, very specific and a very, very difficult leadership skill to uh, to master. So, leading others and developing effective teams is what we focus on uh, for day day two, uh, day three, uh, financial managers. So um, we bring in an, an external consultant, uh, Nigel Moody. He's got significant ex experience uh, both as a, a partner in um, uh, a large firm of uh, of accountants 
and also he worked in uh, HMRC, although we don't mention that very much. Um, but you know, Nigel is fantastic around um, explaining and developing knowledge around finance. You know, so we thought uh, very, very carefully around uh, what should be in MLDP. Should we put finance in? Should, should we put something else? You know, but finance is one of the cornerstones of understanding how um, organizations uh, develop themselves and, uh, and compete. And Nigel is fantastic at uh, delivering uh, his day. So knowing the numbers and asking the right questions you know, so so what is the balance sheet telling you? What is the profit and loss sheet telling you? What is your cash flow um, telling you around the business and how you might want to change? Uh, fourth day, that's uh, that's myself. Um, so uh, I guess my practitioner experience is from Rolls Royce, and uh, I talk around strategy and innovation. So what I've previously gone through gives you a slight flavour of the kind of things we cover. But you know, strategic choices, developing a, a strong strategy, and in the afternoon how to drive innovation, how to develop a process that drives innovation, how to develop a culture uh, of innovation within the organization. And, uh, and the last one, my colleague, uh, Alec Waterworth. So um, Alec's practitioner experience is uh, as a manager at, at BP and uh, Alec delivers the project management, you know, so very, very important, you know, getting things done, delivering projects, implementing, executing, commercializing, and, uh, and Alec goes through the um, the skills and a framework to help develop project management skills. Uh, we have an online working portal, so um, a huge, um, a huge array of learning materials um, in a virtual learning environment that we use called uh, called Blackboard, where you get access to uh, all of the slides, uh, further reading, uh, papers, cases, um, etc. Um, we also have the opportunity to undertake an ILM Level Seven award, so. Level seven is, is postgraduate um, standard. Um, and if you're interested in the ILM award, uh, we ask people to work on, on a work-based project. So, so a real live issue um, or problem or opportunity within their workplace, and then write that up as a reflective practice paper. We also have the opportunity for, for leadership coaching. So we're offering um, three sessions with, uh, with coaches to help you develop your leadership skills and reflect on your, on your development. Next slide, please, please, Kira. So for delegates who come on to the um, NLDP, you know, there's a personal impact. So developing new leadership skills and new ways of thinking, having greater confidence as a leader and a, and a manager in the workplace, opportunity for a professional qualification, ILM Level 7 award, uh, also become part of the Alliance Manchester Business School Executive Network, and also support your, your career develop, development, particularly if you're looking to take the next step and to take on increasing levels of responsibility uh, within your organization. There's also a, a positive impact for organizations. You know, so um, having more effective leaders is important for, for all, all organizations, but also having applied practical skills. You know, we thought very, very hard and very carefully about getting the right balance between, between theories, but also practice. So, what you learn and what we cover in the MLDP is something that you can you know, apply in practice, you know, effectively on the Monday morning after the programme finishes. If you're an organisation who's looking to, to, to maybe implement some change, maybe, maybe reposition themselves in the market, MLDP can be a catalyst um, for that, developing growth and productivity, which all organisations need to develop. Uh, retaining talent, you know, there's, um, there's a question that quite often I'm asked, from organizations which is um you know what if what if i train my people and they leave and uh, i always say well what if you don't train them and they stay and uh, you know there's uh, there's a lot of data that shows that you know by investing in in developing people not only get do you get higher levels of performance within your organization but you also retain your top talent within your organization because they appreciate the opportunity to develop themselves and for delegates who are undertaking the ilm level seven when they're working on that business project, you know, they're actually, you know, developing and delivering value to the organization because they're working on a real life issue, a real life problem, or a real life opportunity and, and resolving it as, uh, as part of the business project. So next slide, please, Kieran. So what you take away from the MLDP, uh, new skills, um, everybody gets a certificate of completion from the University of Manchester. Um, if you undertake the ILM, 
element, um, you have the opportunity to um, have a level seven award. Uh, you also get ILM membership uh, for, for 12 months. You get access to um, um, ILM materials and ILM um, CPD opportunities. There's the opportunity for coaching. Uh, you get e-learning access for up to two years from the University of Manchester. That includes access to the uh, University of Manchester e-library, which contains, you know, every single interesting and useful um, paper and research and insight um, ever written in, uh, in history, and, and also um, access to our executive network. So you'll be invited to events um, at AMBS, so um, guest speakers, um, keynote uh, speakers, thought lead, lead, leader events to help you continue to uh, uh, develop your knowledge and your insights, your skills, but also your, your network as well. Um, in terms of course fees, um, there's various options. So uh, for people who want to undertake all of the modules, the uh, opportunity for three coaching sessions and also the ILM award, it's uh, £4,990 per person. Um, you can also just do the modules and the coaching. That brings it down to 4740. Uh, just the modules and the ILM award, 4490. And if, if, if you just want uh, the five days tuition, uh, 3990. So we've kind of built in opportunities to, to kind of tailor um, the exact learning experience that you want within, within the programme um, overall. I have to say from the programmes we've run um, this year and we've run three this year, the most popular option is, is option one because it delivers the most value um, and the most benefit to, uh, to delegates. Next slide, please. Yeah, so at the top modules, you know, there's five days we deliver that in, in, in a kind of one week concentrated um, block. We deliver it face-to-face uh, -face in, in the classroom. So you'll be kind of learning from the facilitators across those five days, but also learning from um, the other delegates within the classroom. And that's really, really important. You know, we have a very, very broad mix of people um, within the class um, in terms of their senior, seniority from um, you know, fairly medium level managers, people who, who are very advanced in, in their career, uh, people from the public sector, the private sector, charitable sector, people from large complex organizations, people from SMEs and people running, running their own business. So it, it, it's a really, really rich and diverse mix of people. And, you know, learning from other people in the classroom as well as your uh, facilitators is, is a really, really important aspect of the program. Uh, for people who are interested in the coaching, that's three sessions delivered over a three month period. And for people who are undertaking the ILM project, um, that, that goes over a six month period. If you need um, extra time, because we realise that things happen at work and we realise that things happen uh, within families, um, you have up to two years to, uh, to complete the ILM project. Um, we support you through, through that process, through um, action learning sets and also kind of one-to-one -one Zoom meetings um, if, you, if you require those. So, you know, you, you can get it in six months if you need extra time, uh, that's absolutely fine. Uh, forthcoming dates. So uh, next one we're gonna run is gonna be the 31st of January um, next year. Um, that, that's a waiting list only. So, so we've got to our, to our quota. However, if you're interested in that as a date and that date fits your, fits your diary, please put yourself on. The waiting list it, it, it's fairly common that we have one or two um, people dropping out um, so if space does become available then we'll contact you and, and, and say you, you can come on to the, to the January running. Um, next one after that is uh, it, it's the 4th of July we didn't plan it that way um, but there's, there's places available for that and, uh, and the third one we're going to run in uh, 2022 is on the, the 3rd of October. Uh, what people are saying, so, um, you know, we have, uh, we have evaluations, so um, people on the course are asked to evaluate the quality of each of the day's delivery, and, uh, and they're asked to, um, to rate the quality of, uh, of the programme overall, and to give, uh, to give scores out of five, and, uh, and also written feedback, that, that's really important to us, that really helps us um, improve and develop the programme. Um, the last set of results um, against teaching quality, um, people scored as 4.9 out of 5. And for the overall quality, and this is everything, this is the quality of the, uh, the Blackboard site, it's the quality of the facilities, the quality of the classroom, 
quality of the catering, um, quality of the, uh, the process for signing up, um, that was 4.9 out of 5 as well. So as, as, as program director, I, I was sort of very pleased to get those, um, uh, to get those scores. Uh, but more important was the actual uh, the written feedback from from people. So, you know, we just picked out some um, uh, some examples. So, you know, good balance of theory and practical activities, and that's really important. You know, what we're delivering and teaching on the day, we expect you to be able to use in the office on on you know the following Monday morning. So, getting that balance is important. Uh, really useful, very engaging delivery. So, um, I'm not sure. Uh, what experience you might have had previously in university, maybe you've you've gone to traditional lectures where you sit sit down and someone talks at you for two hours. Um, that's not what we do here. You know, it's it it's engaging, and we'll be um, asking you to sort of contribute to, to to the sessions, trying to understand what what your insights are. We'll be going through cases and uh, and exercises to have a really um, engaging experience. Great mix of delivered content content and interactivity. Uh, Tutor did a fantastic job of demystifying the jargon. That was uh, Nigel Moody on the uh, the finance for managers. You know, so we're not there to make things more complicated. We're there to uh, to sort of break it down and uh, and simplify it. Uh, excellent, very useful. Thank you. Course delivery was excellent, and uh, and the last one, genuinely one of the best lecturers I have had throughout the entirety of my academic career. I can reveal that was not me. That was uh, Alec Alec Waterworth on the. Uh, the project management day. So that's a, a quick wrap up on uh, steps of success for, for develop, developing strategy. I hope you find, found that useful. Um, if you are thinking around developing uh, or expect, extending or amending your strategy, I, I, I suggest that's something you should be considering. Um, and also a quick whistle stop tour of the Manchester Leadership Development Programme and what that can deliver. And uh, if you were thinking of coming up to that programme, uh, we'd be very, very happy to uh, to welcome you um, at some stage in 2022. So now I think there's an opportunity for some questions and answers. Joe, jo, have we got some questions in the chat? Hi, box? Yep, Mike, we have got a couple of questions in there already. So uh, just to start us off, uh, Dan, thanks for your question. He's asked a question around whether this particular programme covers or contributes to any of the core aspects of the MBA programme at the business school. I can I can come in on that one if, if you like. So so thanks, Dan. Really good question. We have a lot of people who are considering an MBA and looking at this as a stepping stone. So the answer is yes, I can't speak to the content, but I do know that a couple of the if you complete this program, it does provide certain exemptions from certain modules in the global MBA program. And that not only means that um, you've kind of already, you've already covered that ground, but also it can lead to a reduction in the actual MBA fees. So just to, to reiterate that, if you complete this program, you can then submit this as evidence of prior learning if you want to go on and do a global MBA with Manchester. Yeah, yeah, I think that's um, that, that, that's right, Karen. The, the, the other way to, to, to look at it is, you know, if you're, if you're thinking of doing uh, an MBA, um, that's really great. Um, I mean, I did an MBA myself uh, about sort of 15 years ago, and there was also the MBA director at uh, Aston Business School. So happy to talk to anybody for as long as they like about, about uh, MBAs, but it, it, it's a big commitment. So it, it's a commitment in terms of the fees and it's a commitment in terms of the time you spend on the on the course. And it's very, very intensive, you know, so, you know, completing the MLDP will give you a flavor of that experience, you know, and then if you think this is absolutely fantastic I'm going to go for the you know the sort of full English of the MBA that's great but for some people that that they might think well MLDP has covered covered the, the sort of five bases that I'm looking to to uh, to develop and uh, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll sort of sort of put off the MBA for for later during during my career that's great, great. thanks very much I appreciate that yeah thanks <laughs> for the question Dan further question from Dan um around uh, apprenticeship levy funding so is this particular course um available to use the apprenticeship levy funding on it now it's not is it but kieran do you want to pick up um what other options there are at the business school yeah so if, you, if levy funding is what you want to use we've got a senior leader apprenticeship that is um, i think it's about 24 months it's a differently structured program that fits with the senior leader standard at level seven 
I think the advantage of this program and the fact that it's not levy funded is that we can set our own curriculum. You know, Michael Mike can set his own sort of targets as to what those learning objectives will be. For the senior leader apprenticeship to use those funds, you're very much tied to a specific curriculum, knowledge, skills and behaviour that you have to hit. Um, now, for this course, it's only um, five days taught, so it can be done very, very quickly, whereas the minimum duration for any apprenticeship has to be at least 12 months. So just to be clear, it, it's you can't do the MLDP funded by the levy, but we do have, and we are, I think we're open for applicants uh, for the next March cohort of the Senior Leader Apprenticeship. So Dan, very happy to send you and anybody else who's interested um, details on that and a link to the page where you can, you can inquire and you can find out more. Yeah, if you... Um... If you decide to undertake the the, the apprenticeships, um, I I can confirm that you get more of me. So 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 hopefully that will seal the deal. Grace, thanks very much. One further question um, we've got here is from Robert about the duration of the course. So we have the we've talked about the one week face to face course, but he's also seen um, the option of, di di uh, of running through the course over the nine weeks. So, um, Kieran, would you want to pick that up as well? Yeah, just we, we were experimenting with some of the formats during the lockdown uh, period, and we ran uh, a cohort in February of this year that ran over nine weeks. So it was one day, so the five modules, instead of doing them Monday to Friday, we did them one day um, every fortnight. And actually the feedback from, from that cohort was it was great, but you know what? They wanted it sort of compressed. They wanted shorter gaps in between those sessions. So that nine week uh, option we've decided not to offer. Uh, we do offer an online version that runs now at five weeks. So simple maths, one module every week. Um, at the moment, we're just looking at recruitment for that. So you can book onto that. Um, timing wise, it, it, if it does run, and I say if it does run, it would be March. We need to, to, to get a significant number of people um, interested in that. And to be perfect frank with you Robert um, the, 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 the desire the appetite has all been for face to face um, apart from this this medium that we're on right now in zoom people are clamoring to come back to face to face so that's where all our demand has been we've seen a little bit of demand for online and if there is sufficient we, we will definitely run it and again Robert very happy to pick up with you uh, after this and send you details of how you can register if you if you want to put in for, for, for the online version Great, thanks, Kieran. I think that's it for the questions so far, unless anybody else has got a burning question to type into the chat box. But obviously, if you still are interested in the programme, have any further questions afterwards, uh, you can contact any of us. We'll put the, the um, contact details on the screen next and just get in touch. Everybody will receive a copy of the slide deck and also a recording of this session once it's available. Okay, so just to, to add, there's a few more resources out there. If you do, if you haven't already done so, try and sign up to our YouTube channel. There's a playlist there called Executive Education. This is one of a series of sessions that's been running since about um, the, the middle of last year. Some really interesting information on all of the five modules, not just the strategy one. So that is available there. Um, all that remains is to, uh, it may be a bit premature, but it's to don the official Christmas hats. Uh, and, and to say thank you for joining us this morning and, and on behalf of the team, um, we wish you the very best of, of the season. All the best. Take yeah. care, everyone. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>